Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath day. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the gift of your word and that it's going out to people in other countries too. And please be with us as we study it today. And please send your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And please be with our mouths and help us to speak your words. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 13, 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. So the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. How many of you like to go treasure hunting? When I was a kid, I remember making treasures and making maps and having people find them and doing all kinds of things like that. Well, God has provided for this in our natures. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. Who should I have? I'm very disappointed that I don't have little kids to come help me today. So some of you will have to be young at heart. Let's see. Ruth, will you be my first young at heart? No. <laughs> no I just want you to open the treasure chest. <gasps> a diamond. No, a diamond. Do you want to touch it? No. <laughs> Okay, so she found a treasure. The rest of that verse says when you know there's a treasure, you have to sell all you have and go and buy it. And so, all right, so there's our treasure. Now, this is important to us because of this quotation found in Great Controversy, page 521.3. 521.3. No church can advance in holiness unless its members are earnestly seeking for truth as for hid treasure. Let me repeat that so that you make sure you get it right. No church can advance in holiness unless some of its members... Unless its members, all of them, are earnestly seeking for truth as for hid treasure. This does not mean the pastor seeks for truth. doesn't mean just the Sabbath school teachers. It means everybody is supposed to be earnestly seeking for truth as for hid treasure. <clears throat> okay, let's look up Proverbs 1, 5, and 6. Okay, when you guys have it, you can raise your hand because I want everybody to get to see these texts. Okay, I see some hands. All right. Okay, Dallas is going to read for us. So the a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Okay, <clears throat> so the wise are going to be trying to understand proverbs and their interpretation. The words of the wise and their dark sayings. And there's not anything that has more wisdom in it than the Bible, right? So this is what the wise should be doing. Now, a long time ago, I read a story about a man by the name of J.B. Cooks. And this story took place in South Africa. His mother had died and he went and he wanted to... Um, make some money. Now, in those parts, anybody that knows, there's a lot of diamonds, interestingly enough. And so he bought a plot of land, and he and a friend got together, and every day they would go dig on this plot of land. And the way that it went was there was a layer of gravel on the top, and most of the diamonds were in that layer of gravel. And so they would dig through the gravel every day, and they got enough to pay their bills and to live fairly well, but they never really struck the treasure. They would dig through that top layer of gravel, and then when they got to the dirt, they would move on to the next section. Well, sometimes they saw their neighbors digging a little deeper, but they thought, well, maybe that's how deep the gravel goes. Well, I guess at some point, 
they sold the property to somebody else, somebody else came in and dug on that same property. And they dug a little deeper, and guess what happened? They found all the riches in the diamonds because they dug a little deeper. Apparently there was a thin layer of dirt and another layer of gravel that had all the diamonds in it, and that was where all the riches were. So they never got rich, why? Because they didn't dig deep enough. And it's the same thing in the Word of God. This is from Christian Education, page 58. But there is but little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. One may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. So if we would get what we need to out of the Bible, we don't do a hasty McDonald's meal. <laughs> we want to take the time to read. There's little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. So you may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see the deep and hidden meaning in there. So we have to dig deeper. How do we study deeper? Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. Okay. Isaiah, Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. Okay, I saw some hands, so let's go ahead and read that one. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest, wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Okay, so God's word comes to us like this, precept upon precept. It's kind of like picking huckleberries, isn't it? You pick a few here, you pick a few there, you put them in your bucket, you finish a line, you move on to the next line, and you don't just pick up the whole bush at once. The, the treasure is in the here a little and there a little, and in North Idaho that's worth quite a bit. Um, but some people, as it said go and fall backward and are broken and snared and taken. One reason for this is because people reject the proof text method. Instead of looking here a little and there a little, finding all the words, all the verses that talk about the Sabbath or finding all the verses that talk about the state of the dead, they read the Bible just like any other text. The other reason is what I call goof texting. That means instead of letting the Bible interpret itself, people just guess at what the meaning is. And that's also incorrect. So if you don't want to be broken and snared and taken, don't reject the proof text method, but also don't, don't practice goof texting and just guessing what the Bible means. The Bible will interpret itself. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2.13. Because... Sometimes we think, some of those people think that they can, like I said, study the Bible as from other books. But the Bible is not according to man's wisdom. We have to pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth. 1 Corinthians 2.13. Okay, I see some hands. Go ahead. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, so we're comparing spiritual things, this verse, with that verse, and asking the Holy Spirit to lead us. 1 Corinthians 15, 46 gives us another clue. 
1 Corinthians 15, 46. If we're actually using the Bible, we should learn to study the Bible from the Bible, right? It, it tells how to study itself. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 46. Got that? Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Okay, so first we have, this one doesn't work. First we have the spiritual, no, sorry, you're right. <laughs> Just checking to see if you're listening. This is why you never listen to man's words. You always follow the word of God. Okay, first is natural. And second is spiritual. I'm glad to see you guys are listening. This is why we say again and again, we are just fallible humans. Listen to the word of God. Okay, so that's the way it goes. That's how the Bible says it is. First, that which is natural. Next, that which is spiritual. And we know that this is things like the lamb that was slain, representing the lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to pick a verse and demonstrate how to go about doing this. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. Everybody got that? It says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. And I'm calling for my object lesson here, which I forgot. But most of you are going to know, if I put a piece of bread in water, what happens? Okay, we're going to put some bread in here and see how it fares by the end of the day. Okay? Can you see this thing? I'm putting bread into the water. No. Casting my bread upon the waters. I once had, um, had a minister that said about this verse something along the lines of, this verse is pointless. Everybody knows that if you throw your bread in the water, it will grow soggy and will get eaten by the fish. This is just a depressed Solomon showing the futility of our efforts. This is an example of interpreting the Bible with man's wisdom. But we have to interpret it as the Holy Spirit leads with God's wisdom. So it is getting kind of soggy a little bit. But let's see if we can dig a little deeper in this verse. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Let's see what the Bible says. Does it say there are some verses that just really don't make any sense? 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Okay. Everybody there? And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that's not just a depressed Solomon. The Bible states of itself that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that's a whole study of itself. But what we're going to do to dig a little deeper in this verse and see what it means, and probably all you good proof texters know this already, but let's see. I'll pick on two young people this time. Mm -hmm. Daniel and Diana, I'm going to let you come pick the two objects out of the Bible. So we look in the text, we want to pick out the objects that we can touch. Okay, so show them what you got. What do we have? Okay, the, the, okay, I didn't want to put water in there, but the cups to represent water. So our two objects are bread 
and water. Okay, we're going to write this text on the board. Cast by bread upon the waters. Okay, we're just going to work on that part right now. Okay, so we just picked the two objects out of it that are something we can touch or nouns for those of you that like to do English. Um, and that's where we start. Now what we do with this is look up each one of these words in a concordance. Miller used Cruden's concordance. It's a good concordance. I don't know how available it is nowadays. Or you can get a Strong's. You probably want something bigger than what's in the back of your Bible so that you can get every place that the word bread is used in the Bible. And look that up. Now, I've done some of that for us so that we can um, move forward without too much delay. Let's look up Matthew 4.4 4 is one of the places that the word bread is used. We're looking for a definition of the word bread. What does the Bible say bread can represent? Matthew 4.4. 4. Okay. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay. So here we have the word of God, but let's double check it. How about Amos 8.11? Amos 8.11. Gives us another definition here. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Okay, so we're going to stick the phrase word of the Lord here. We will capitalize Word of the Lord. Okay? So we put, leave the physical, write the spiritual above it. Now, this was a fairly easy one, but I do want to give you an example of what you have to do sometimes. Sometimes if you don't get it at this level, you have to dig a little deeper. So with the same verse, let's see if we can look at another couple of verses to establish it. Here's an example of where you don't find the answer with the first text. You have to put two together. 1 Corinthians 5.8. 1 Corinthians 5.8. Okay, we have bread in this verse. Go ahead. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, so we have, here we have the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is truth? What does this represent? John 17, 17. We'll follow this out. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay. So you can see the same thing. The first verse said that unleavened bread represented sincerity and truth. And this says that thy word is truth. So we came to the same conclusion that the word of Lord, the Lord and bread go together. Okay, so then we plug it in and we're going to read it. Cast thy word of the Lord upon the waters. Now I do not suggest doing half of a verse like this because you end up with some interesting concepts. We don't really want to take our Bibles and throw them into literal water. So typically you need to replace all the things in the verse. But God does bless that sometimes. I had a story to share with you. A long time ago um, in Japan, they actually had some sort of blockade that was supposed to keep the Bible and Christianity from coming in. 
But one day, one of the leaders that was manning the blockade saw something floating out in the water. And he said, somebody go get me that. I need to see what it is. Well, when they fished it out, it was a Bible. And I'm, I don't know if it was maybe a little wet or whatever, but there was enough that they could still see what it was and they could tell. Um, and so they read him a few verses out of it. He didn't speak the language that the Bible was in, but he had somebody translating it and telling him what it was about. And it was just enough to pique his curiosity. And over the years, and by many different means, he continued to learn more about the book, the Bible. And after many days, he did indeed become a Christian. So it says, cast thy bread upon the waters, and after many days thou shalt find it. So in that case, God blessed even the the half there. I don't know how the Bible got there. But let's finish this up. Let's look up the spiritual meaning of waters. Isaiah 17, 13. Isaiah 17, 13. Okay, I'm going to let you guys tell me this time after we read it what it represents. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Okay, so what does waters represent in this verse? Could it represent nations? Nations, okay, that's correct. So, it's nations. Okay, we're going to look up a second witness here. Um, let's see. Revelation seventeen fifteen. Revelation seventeen fifteen. And he said unto me. The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay, so what does waters represent in this verse? People. People. Peoples, multitudes, nations again, and tongues. Okay, so I'm just going to add peoples here. So it's... Okay, so now... After we plug those in, um, we can see a promise that God is giving us. If we paraphrase this, cast the word of God upon the people of the world, for thou shalt find it after many days. This is a missionary promise that God has given us in his word. Now, when you're doing proof texting, I want to make it clear Whatever you find digging deeper has to match the surface truth. So when you come to a conclusion, you need to check and make sure it harmonizes with the surface truth. Let's see if we can find another verse that shows this is what God's trying to say. But before we do that, let's, um, let's look at the word days. Days can mean plain day. But you could do days too. Those of you that are good prophecy students will know Numbers 13.34 says that a day represents something else. You want to read that? Numbers 13.34 and then Ezekiel 4.6. Okay, Numbers 14.34 then. Okay, what does it say? After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Okay, so what can a day represent? A year. So we could put year. Go ahead and read the other verse. That was Ezekiel 4, 6. I don't want you to give up if you've handed out literature or a Bible or something after a few days. It may take years, sometimes. Ezekiel 4, 6. 
And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Okay. So, that again is a beautiful promise. Cast the word of the Lord upon the nations or peoples, for thou shalt find it after many days or years. Okay. So let's check this with the surface truth in the Bible to make sure it harmonizes. Isaiah 55, 11. Let's see if this matches. Do we have a correct answer or not? Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. And it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Okay, so God's word goes forth out of his mouth. It does not return void. It accomplishes. So God's word, the bread, is cast out to do what it needs to, and it accomplishes, it says, that which I please, and it prospers. This is the same concept of cast thy bread upon the waters. So this is... We'll just put a check mark here. This harmonizes with the surface truth of the Bible. But it's so much more fun when you have to look for it, isn't it? <laughs> well, you get a second witness to the first verse there. Now, another interesting thing when you're doing this in the Bible is sometimes there is more than one layer. Often there is more than one layer. Or you can say it's like an onion with all the layers, or you can say it's like a diamond with all its facets of all those different gleamings of truth. Now, one time when we were doing this for Sabbath school, a young man had picked this text to treasure hunt, because for a while we actually did this where everybody would pick a text and dig for hidden treasure in it and then bring it and share it. And somebody picked this text to hunt, and I had already done it this way. So I knew what it was, right? Well, they came to the same conclusion on the bread, although there are others, but they came to the same conclusion on the bread. And, but when it came to the waters, they had a different definition. And I immediately thought, think, started thinking, well, they don't have it right. They really should have put that because it fits. Well, I needed to learn a little bit. There are different facets that different people see, and as long as it matches the surface truth, it's not a wrong answer. So he used this verse to show that waters are the Holy Spirit. John 7, 38 and 39. John 7, 38 and 39. This was Jesus talking. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so here the living water and the Holy Ghost parallel. And so you could put this in, in this spot. And then we have a promise that says, cast the word of the Lord upon the Holy Spirit, for thou shalt find it after many days or years. Does that match the surface truth in the Bible? This is actually a beautiful promise. When you're stuck and you're trying to study the Bible, if you will persevere with asking the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Bible promises that God will help you find it after many days. Sometimes it comes faster, but let's look and see if this matches the surface truth. John 16, 13.
John 16, 13. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay. So this is showing that the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth. Remember that the truth was the unleavened bread, which is the word of God. Also, John 14, 26. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, so again, this matches the surface truth, so we can say we have a correct application of it. Now, remember this. When I was a kid, I used to go shelling with my family on the beach. We'd go find a nice shelling beach, and we would pick up the different pretty shells. Well, sometimes there was one person that didn't find something, and we always felt kind of sorry for them. But you couldn't just hand them a shell or buy them one at the shell shop because it wasn't the same as finding it themselves. And so actually what we would do sometimes is have somebody run ahead and hide it and bury it, and then somebody else would direct their path to it so they could find it. But the point being, it means more when you have to work for it and find it yourself. And this is why nobody else can study the Bible for you. You can't go to enough sermons. You can't go to enough Bible studies. You have to study it for yourself. This um, quote is what I'm going to end with before Dallas shows the same principle with studying the parables of Jesus. This is from Review and Herald, November 15, 1892. She says, we do not perceive the meaning of the word of God without much study. But the reward of the study of the Bible is exceedingly precious to him who fears God and earnestly searches for truth as for hidden treasure. At the present day, there are a large number in our churches who are not sufficiently interested in Bible study to seek to understand the mysteries of truth. They do not go below the surface. So there's a lot of members not going below the surface. Those who are living in these last days who acknowledge the binding claims of the law of God have no ordinary responsibility. They are not to be satisfied with the surface truth. So she just said, those living in the last days are not to be satisfied with the surface truth. That which lies plainly revealed, which cost us no effort, will not be esteemed as highly as the treasure that cost us diligent, prayerful research and investigation. So I hope this will give you a little bit to recognize that the Bible's not just talking about soggy bread. It's got something hidden beneath the surface that we can learn. Okay, I want everybody to look up Matthew 13, 34, and 35. Matthew 13, 34, and 35. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Okay, so in the... This verse here, these verses, it says that Jesus always talked to the people in parables. And it says, without a parable spake he not <coughs> unto them. And it also says that when he spoke to them in parables, he was telling them what had been kept secret from the foundations of the world. In other words, 
there's mysteries hidden in those parables that have been hidden from mankind ever since the world was created. Matthew 13, 10, and 11. Okay. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So here Jesus tells why he tells people secrets in parable form. It's so that his people will understand the mysteries, but the wicked won't understand. Mark 4, 10 through 14. Mark 4, 10 through 14. Everybody got it? And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? <clears throat> and, how, sorry, excuse me. and how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. Okay, so Jesus tells his disciples here, if you don't understand this parable, then how are you going to understand all parables. In other words, he's telling them with this parable, he's giving them the principles for understanding all parables. And we see what that is. Uh, if you look up Luke 8, 11. Luke 8, 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So what do we see in that verse? What principle do we see there? We see a physical or a natural object representing something spiritual. So just like Susanna pointed out before, First the natural, then the spiritual. Okay, the verse we're going to study out is Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. Luke 15, 8 through 10. Okay, everybody got it? Luke 15, 8 through 10. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I, had found, I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Okay. So, what do we see in this verse? While well, I'm finishing writing it here, what is the surface layer? What do you get from this verse just on the surface? Okay. The last verse is a good clue of what the surface is. I can't find it.
Okay, uh, this is a quote from Christ Object Lessons. Christ Object Lessons, page 198. The parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son bring out in distinct lines God's pitying love for those who are straying from him. Although they have turned away from God, he does not leave them in their misery. He is full of kindness and tender pity toward all who are exposed to the temptations of the artful foe. So the surface meaning, and you said it, is showing how God goes in search of that one lost person. Somebody has strayed from the flock, and he goes in search of that one lost person. And the, the surface meaning would also be talking about us, how we're to be working for God as the she as under shepherds to go out and bring in that one lost person that is lost. Now, I need five children. <laughs> how many are children in here? There's a few. Okay. Uh, how about you and... Uh, you want to help? Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's see. You and you. Was that that was four? four? That's four. Blaine. <laughs> <coughs> I need each of you to come up here and take something out of this Bible. And turn it around and show everybody what you got. No, we'll set it. Maybe you can here. just stand in a line so the camera can see. Oh, you want us to hold it? So the, yeah, so they can see what you got. Thank you. Okay, so what did we get? Okay, so we have. A we woman. have a woman. We have ten pieces of silver. We have a candle. We have a house. And we have a broom. Now, it didn't mention broom in the text, but it implied broom because it said sweep. Mm -hmm. what, what do you do when you sweep? You use a broom. So that's what the broom represents. Okay, we'll just set those back up here. Okay, so in this in this verse, what's the first thing that we see that is something physical that you can actually touch? Woman. Okay. So look up Isaiah 54, 5, and 6. Isaiah 54, 5, and 6. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Okay. Jeremiah 6, 2. Jeremiah 6, 2. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. 
Okay, and Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Okay, so using all these texts, what would a woman represent? Church. Church. Okay, but now I want to point out something here that is a good principle to understand anytime you're proof texting. If there's an object, you have to look at the context in which it's talked about because there's such a thing as a good woman or a bad woman. So uh, look up Revelation 2.20. Revelation 2.20 Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Okay, so would that be a good woman or a bad woman? Bad woman. It's a bad woman. Uh, Revelation 17, 1 to 6. Revelation 17, 1 to 6. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration." Okay, so is that a good woman? Yeah. That's a bad woman. So you can tell by the context what kind of woman it is. Proverbs 31, verse 10 and 27. Proverbs 31, verses 10 and 37. I mean 27, sorry. Thirty-one, ten, and twenty-seven. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. And then it says, She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Okay, so is that a bad woman or a good woman? That's a good woman. Okay, so looking at this verse here, when it's talking about a woman, is this talking about a good woman or a bad woman? Okay, so it says that she lost something, but she's seeking diligently, she's searching, she's working to try to find what's been lost. So we can assume that this is talking about a good woman. Now what's the next 
physical object here. Okay. Ten pieces of silver. Look up Psalm twelve six. Psalm twelve six. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay. So what what does silver represent in this verse? God's word. God's word. Okay, look up. Psalm 119, verse 72. Psalm 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. So what does silver represent here? God's word. God's word, the law. God's law. So this says that this woman had ten pieces. Now what part of God's word or God's law comes in ten pieces? Ten Commandments. So we can already start to see a spiritual application here. So one piece gets lost of this. And what happens when one piece gets lost? What's the next physical object we see here? Candle. Candle. Psalm 119, 105. If you haven't turned a page, you might be there. <laughs> Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now this, this verse doesn't actually use the word candle, but it uses the word lamp. And actually, if you look up Proverbs 31, 18... This word that you just read that said lamp, that's actually the Hebrew word near, and it is actually the word for candle, even though it's translated as lamp in that verse. Proverbs 31, 18. It says, She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. Okay, so we see... The same word being used as candle and being used as lamp, which that's what a candle is. It's a lamp that's providing light. Psalm 18, verse 28. Psalm 18, verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Okay, so using all these verses here, what does candle represent? Blaine is answering without saying anything. <laughs> Okay. Thy word is a lamp. Thy word is a lamp. It's the word of God. But this, the verse in uh, Psalm eighteen twenty eight, God is going to enlighten our darkness with His word. So uh, look up 
Psalm 43, 3. Psalm 43.3. O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me, let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Okay, so what does light represent? If, it, if light is something physical, what does it represent? It represents truth. But that other verse said that God will lighten our darkness. So to light a candle is to study God's word to discover truth. It is, that is lighting the candle. Now, what's the next physical object we see here? Okay. Well, the next physical object we see, if you look at the wording, is the word house. But there's another physical object that was being used right here with the word sweep. It's the broom. Okay. So, when you sweep something, what are you doing? You're cleaning. What 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 is the purpose of a broom sweeping? Removing. What's it removing? Dirt. Dirt and dust. Okay. Look up. Psalm 103, 14. Psalm 103, 14. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Okay. So he remembereth that we are dust. Genesis 3.19. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So what would dust represent? Us. Us. That's man. Man's ideas, man's theories, man's philosophies. The things that we do. Man's traditions. Man's traditions. That's a good way to do it. Okay. So sweeping is removing that dust. Look up. Moving on here to the house. Look up. Hebrews 3, 6. Hebrews 3, verse 6. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Okay, so we are the house. 1 Timothy 3.15 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay, so what would house represent? Church. Okay, 
Okay, now this is interesting because we have two different representations for the word church. We have a woman and a house. Now, what is a woman? A person. What is a house? It's a structure. So, now putting all of this back into this verse here, we see that a church, the people that make up the church, have ten pieces, they have the ten commandments, but one gets lost. So, these people search the word of God to learn the truth. And they get rid of man's ideas, man's theories, man's traditions from the structure. And they seek diligently until they find this one lost piece of silver. Now, w which commandment would that be? The fourth. <laughs> yeah. I would suggest, too, that there's more layers than just the there's, Sabbath being lost. There's, there's other commandments that have layers. been lost. I'm only but. covering one layer here. There's definitely more layers here. But one thing that I want to point out, whenever you're doing proof texting, a lot of people like to think that they can just do something themselves and be good to go. But we're told that... In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Godly counselors. Look up 2 Peter 1.20. 2 Peter 1.20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Okay, so... If we found this meaning in this verse, this should not be because Dallas said so. We should see this shown other people finding this in their own study type of thing. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. And Proverbs twenty four, verse six. Proverbs twenty four, verse six. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. So we're told that we need to double check it with our godly brethren. Make sure that it's, you know, that we're not getting off somewhere. So, how many of you have seen this book? It's called, it's called 500... 501 illustrations. This was rivet, rivet. This, <laughs> this was written by Robert Pearson. Everybody know who Robert Pearson was? He was the general conference president years ago. Robert Pearson was a proof texter. In fact, when Robert Pearson became president, he actually removed a bunch of leaders that were in the higher critical mindset and put in proof textures in a lot of our institutions. But Robert Pearson, on page 238 of this book, has a whole paragraph on this parable right here. And this is what he says. In Luke 15, 8 and 9, the woman, the church, had ten pieces of silver and lost one. The psalmist describes the law as silver, Psalm 119.72 
One piece of silver, one commandment, the fourth, was lost by the church. The woman in the parable used a candle to help search for the lost piece of silver. In Luke 15, 8. The word of God is called a candle in Psalm 11, 105. God's house is the church. 1 Timothy 3.15 It takes the Bible to find out what happened to the lost commandment and how to find it. So there we see that other people have reached the same conclusion. But we didn't get it from him. We got it from the Bible itself. So that's just to show you what can be done with every single verse. Because remember my favorite quote? It says... It is impossible for any human mind to exhaust one promise or truth of the Bible. That means that nobody in this room can exhaust what's in this text. No matter how much you study it, you'll never exhaust it. Proverbs 2, 1-5. As we close here, God has given us a promise of what will what he will do for us if we follow his way of studying his word proverbs 2 1 to 5 my son if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. So that's giving you just a brief crash course in how to proof text throughout the Bible, and I challenge each of you to go home and Begin to look at the word of God in that light and start to find the hidden things that God has given us in his word. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for a wonderful Sabbath day. Thank you for all the many treasures that you've given us in your word. Please send your Holy Spirit to be with us through the coming week and guide and direct our minds. Help us to spend more time in your word and learn the wonderful truths and treasures that you've given us and help us to all be ready for heaven in Jesus name amen